exactly everybody else is too small.
<laughs> Four of his grandchildren, uh, Gideon King, Collier King, uh, Ilona Lieber, and Johanna Lieber. Good they name. Also? Representation. <laughs> developing the unique freeze-drying method to reduce the gallons of gold broth to a token dry. He shared the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology of Medicine in 1945 with Alexander Fleming and Howard Foley. In his speech at the Nobel Banquet, Professor Chain talked about how grateful he was to work on penicillin, which he said, In 1973, Sir Ernst retired from the chair of biochemistry and became emeritus professor. In 2012, the building where he lived and worked was renamed the Sir Ernst Chain Building, Wilson Laboratories. That building and this lecture are ongoing reminders of his achievements. Tonight's speaker, Professor Richard Henderson, is every bit as passionate about the power and developing cryo-electron microscopy for the high-resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. In describing electron cryo-microscopy during his Nobel lecture, Professor Henderson said, this is much easier to understand than the gravitational waves and the black holes. You just take images of the molecules. You can see them, then in a computer, in the computer you calculate the structure. Anyone can do this kind of work. <laughs> this is an extremely modest explanation for Professor Henderson's lifetime of insights, discoveries, and hard work. Professor Henderson and his colleagues underpinned the resolution revolution that unlocked many important problems in st structural biology. Their work has helped us to understand, better understand membrane proteins and viruses like Zika and it is leading to better pharmaceuticals and better decisions on their use. Professor Henderson graduated with a first from Edinburgh University in Physics. He became excited about the applications of physics to biological questions as a research student at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. He undertook his PhD in the group of David Lowe and determined the atomic structure of cryptom Richard returned to LMB in 1975, where he met Nigel Unwin, igniting the idea that electron microscopes could provide atomic resolution of proteins. Together, they developed techniques in electron crystallography and established the first low-resolution structure of bacterium dopsin, a membrane protein belonging to a family of receptors known as GPCRs, one of the most important drug targets 
1990, Richard went on to solve the atomic structure of ectoradopsin, one of the first atomic models ever derived from membrane proteins. Richard's interest in GPCRs led to his co-founding Heptares Therapeutics to develop new drugs targeting GPCRs in human diseases. Over the last 20 years, Richard has focused on obtaining atomic resolution information from proteins that cannot be crystallized. Richard's contributions are many, spanning improvements in image detection, software development, and breakthroughs that minimize the effects of radiation damage on biological samples. Professor Henderson has received many awards and prizes. He is an EMV EMBO member, a fellow of the Royal Society, and a foreign associate of the UNESCO National Academy of Sciences. Richard continues to develop new methods in cryo-EM in order to understand the molecular mechanisms of proteins involved in human disease. Tonight, we will hear about this in his lecture, The Electron Cryomicroscopy Revolution in Structural Biology. Please join me in welcoming Professor PhD student in 1966 uh, asked if I could join the people who brought all our computing from Cambridge because there was really only one computer and it was here at uh, the Imperial College IBM 1790 and we had an hour a day on it, every day. Um, and, and so that was my first visit to, uh, to Imperial College. And then later on when Jim Barber was the head of the probably the biochemistry department at that point. Um, and the biochemistry department here had decided uh, that electron microscopy, electron cryo microscopy, which at that stage was largely focused at least at high resolution on uh, making two-dimensional crystals of membrane proteins. And Jim Barber was interested in that. He Jim and, and, and Marin in about 1996 and 1997. And obviously they had to recruit, get, get money for it. And at one of my little jobs I was asked to do by Jim was would I mind going and giving a lecture, much like today, about you know, the future of cryo-M, but of course it was 25 years ago, to uh, Smith Klein um, in um, Harlow. And one morning, it was a bit, the, ti the timing was quite tight. I went for an hour, told them that it was wonderful that they should support Imperial College, and next day they gave Imperial a quarter of a million pounds, which would be like half a million now. Um, but I always was impressed. I think they decided ahead of time, actually. I, I had nothing to do with it. Imperial has very good connections to pharma companies, part because of the, the patents and the outreach and the licensing. So when they're asked to give money, somehow or other they're always terribly willing. So I've, I've, that was two of my little mini stories. And of course, I did think about it. I, I reckoned I could spend one or two hours telling you Imperial College stories. But uh, instead of that, I'll tell you a little bit about CryUM. So um, 
that's a, a title. Um, the cryo, I'll stand a bit further forward. The cryo um, revolution in structural biology and about, oh, nearly 20 years ago now, uh, lots of people were interested in it and didn't know what it was. So Tim Baker and I made this slide to try and give people an overview of what cryo-electron microscopy was about. And so it was, what is it? It was published in the International Tables for Crystallography in round about the year 2000. And, and we picked these uh, four samples that neither Tim Baker nor I worked on to give good examples that it was a field, it was broad, it was generous, it was collaborative. And, and they are quite interesting for different reasons. So the first one is an image of E. coli 70S ribosomes taken by the group of Joachim Frank, who was one of the people who shared this Nobel Prize. But it could equally have well have been a similar picture taken by Marin van Heel's group, because Joachim and Marin were going uh, alongside one another uh, in all the early stages of developing single particle cryo-M. But at that stage, it was relatively low resolution. So 11 angstroms means you get a model like this. This is 10 times magnified compared to the image. The small subunit, the large subunit of the ribosome, uh, a long RNA helix, a little bit of tRNA, but not enough to find chemical detail. And so everybody who worked on this realized that the goal was to take this field forward so that you could do really powerful uh, work where you, you reached from biology into chemistry by seeing uh, the chemistry of the amino acid. The second panel is a single particle in uh, frozen in a thin film of amorphous ice of the hepatitis B core uh, protein. And Bettina Botcher, who was a, a postdoc at the MRC LMB in Cambridge, took these pictures and got this model in 1997. Uh, and it was the first time um, a single particle cryo model was obtained where the resolution was better than 10 angstroms. So it's about seven angstroms is enough to see in these protrusions from the virus. You can see the little ridges along the edge. That's a bundle of four alpha helices, an alpha helical bundle uh, sticking out from the virus. And, and she got that because one of the early microscopes that we had in Cambridge was one of the first ones with a field emission gun. And then the one that was here was, was probably the second or third to, to, to push into cryo-EM using the, the better technology. The third one is an example of, a, instead of single particles, uh, one-dimensionally ordered structures. So a helical filament, which is the thin filament of muscle decorated with uh, myosin head groups, which are underlying muscle contraction. The blue is a filament of actin. The green is uh, tropomyosin, which strengthens and winds around the, the actin filament. And then the, the pink, orange, and yellow are, are domains of, of the myosin head group. And Ron Milligan's group in 1995 had it at very low resolution. But now, of course, it's much higher. And this is, uh, forms the core of understanding how muscle contraction works. And then the last panel was the work done by Werner Kuhlbrandt's group, uh, which uh, was done at the MBL in Heidelberg. And that was the work that alerted um, uh, Imperial College to the possibility that this would lead to great things. And Werner was the candidate who went to Max Planck instead of Marin van Heel in 1996 or 1997. But what they got from images like this of these two-dimensionally ordered crystals was a high-resolution atomic model. So in the, so let's say, 19, late 18, 1980s to 1990s, you could do electron cry microscopy of 2D crystals and, and make an atomic model. But the, the helices and the single particles needed further development of methodology and techniques. And I'll tell you a bit about that um, here. But uh, before I got sucked into or persuaded that the single particle cryo-M was where the, the, the power of electron microscopy in the future lay, I was starting life uh, uh, you know, in my first visit to Imperial as a x-ray crystallography. We were making crystals, 3D structures, x-ray diffraction. Um, and when I came back from Yale, um, as Alice has mentioned, um, we were trying to make 3D crystals of membrane proteins. And they were very difficult to make uh, in those days. And fortunately, I met in 1973 Nigel Unwin, who had come to the MRC Molecular Biology Lab from uh, material science metallurgy and was an expert in electron microscopy. So we got together, and instead of trying to purify these proteins out of the membrane of a cell, this is Helibacterium salinarium, these little patches are 2D crystals of the protein bacteria Rhodopsin, a light-driven proton pump. Uh, 
the idea was just to take one of these, put it in the electron microscope, get electron diffraction patterns and image, and within a year or so, we had this model, which is the, the one that was mentioned, at low resolution, room temperature, no cryo. Um, but Nigel was the one that sort of, let's see, uh, guided me and mentored me in the transition from being an X-ray crystallographer to being an electron crystallographer, but not yet doing images of single particles. And, and we couldn't understand why we were limited to only having this sort of low resolution rod-shaped features, seven angstroms apart, seven angstrom resolution. It was a structure at low resolution of a membrane protein with seven transmembrane helices, but nothing we were doing, taking the specimen, putting it in the microscope, taking images, taking diffraction patterns, there was nothing about that procedure that said you only get seven angstrom structures. You should get really high resolution structures. And so the, the task back then was to try and identify what was the next weakest link, address that, and overcome it, and so on. And so the next slide shows you our efforts from 1975 to 1990. Uh, first of all, more and more electron diffraction, uh, molecular averaging, heavy atom derivatives, model building, and so on. We didn't do very well, and we didn't do much. It's slightly better, but not much better. And it was the transition after 1984 from room temperature microscopy, or room temperature diffraction, into cryo microscopy that allowed us to then get images with high resolution phases and get this map initially, and then this map uh, finally in 1990 with enough features, on the next slide, enough features protruding from these transmembrane rods of density, the seven alpha helices, that represent the side chains of the protein. And then knowing by then the sequence was, uh, protein sequence determined by Ovchinnikov and Karana, you could build a model now where the side chains of phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and the beta ion of so we had, we had an atomic model at near atomic resolution of the entire protein structure. And that was then, it was the second membrane protein structure. The first one was uh, hartmut Mikkel's X-ray crystallography work on the reaction center, for which they were awarded the 1988 Nobel Prize before this work was done. So then um, we, we carried on trying to make crystals of different membrane proteins, different structures, and it turned out to be almost as difficult to make two-dimensional crystals for electron crystallography as it was to make 3D crystals. And so another parallel development came from the work of Joachim Frank, of, of uh, Jacques Dubochet, who was recruited as a group leader at EMBL in the early 1980s by John Kendrew, uh, who, who had been one of the MRC lab's early founders, uh, with the specific goal of trying to develop better ways of making uh, thin films of, of ice and studying their properties in the electron beam and getting 3D models from ice embedded samples. And Jacques with his colleagues, Alistair McDowell and Mark Adrian developed this method of uh, plunge freezing where you put a little droplet of your sample, you know, with one mg per mil of protein, ribosomes, viruses, anything that you're interested in. You put that, a little droplet on that three millimeter EM grid, blot it with filter paper, that was an Alistair McDowell development, plunge it into liquid ethane at the temperature of liquid nitrogen temperature, and you get a thin film of amorphous rather than crystalline ice because it cools so rapidly. And they had this gravity-fed and elastic ba band-powered freezing. And now, of course, you buy a computer-controlled piece of filter paper, and it costs 60,000 pounds or something like that. So one of the many samples Du Boucher examined, and they had a great review uh, in this Quarter reviews of Biophysics 1988, where they had dozens and dozens of pictures. And just by looking at them, you knew this method had great potential, but it needed to have development. But one of the pictures they took was this one, which was published in Nature in 1984. It was pictures of intact adenovirus. A few of them fall apart. What the air water interface, you can see the odd subunit. There are some spikes sticking out of some of the viruses. And that sample was. Uh, the life's work of the second director that followed on from, from Kendrew. So there is actually the funny story that um, on Friday before the second director of EML arrived, Du Boucher was given tenure by John Kendrew. And then on Monday, he was, he was then sacked by the second director. But then he had the, the great wisdom to take a picture of this sample. And then he was reinstated. And then he stayed there, <laughs> stayed there for about another five years and then moved to Lausanne where he's now, he's now retired. But this, is, this was a great picture. You can see the viruses, you can see the subunits. You, you just knew by looking at this that it was gonna work out. And actually we had a student in Cambridge 
uh, we knew about this work. We sent one of our students, Linda Amos and I, on this course. And when he came back, he resigned from our project. He said, this is what I'm going to do. For, this is the future. So even in, in the mid-1980s, it was known there was going to be a lot of progress in the quiet realm. But it took a long time. So this uh, 3D model from images like this was made by Phoebe Stewart. Uh, 1991, seven years later it took before this images like this were converted because it needed computer programs and so on. And, it, and the resolution was, bat, was 35 angstroms, not really even enough to quite resolve the subunits. Um, and the reason that it's, it's low and it's fuzzy, the image is, is fuzzy. And, and the reason it's fuzzy is that the, the recording of the Fourier components that represent the structure in that image, the low resolution ones are fine. That's the ones you see, gives you all the contrast. But fine details, there aren't any in the image. And, and uh, uh, a parameter that describes how fast these high resolution uh, details in the image fade out, which is underlying all our efforts to try and make it better, is we use this B factor, which is the Debye Waller factor. It's been around for 100 years. It was originally used to describe disorder in sodium chloride crystals, where the B factors were like two. And typical protein structures, you don't get a really good protein structure by X-ray crystallography unless you have B factors about 30 or so, or 40. So we had 3,000, and that's why it's only 35 angstroms. But, but now, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of use this as a theme as we go through it, you'll see how gradually, as particular instrumental developments and computing developments have, have been developed, this has improved. And one of the improvements came from, so this is 1991, this is a similar image, taken 20 years later by Hong Cho's group, now at UCLA. And that's the same adenovirus in the same thin film of rapidly frozen, plunge frozen ice. And the, the film's also recorded on film. So not on any of the new detectors. But when you look at it, you can see a lot finer detail in the edge of, of the virus here. And that's because it was on a high voltage microscope with better vacuums and a very coherent field emission gun. And those were improvements made by the EM manufacturers that improved it. And when images like this were processed, Hong Chu's group got this structure uh, from images like this, instead of at 35, at 3.6 angstrom resolution. So 10 times the resolution, 1,000 times the data, a lot more work. Um, but you now look at one of the subunits, uh, the hexons or the pentons, and within it, at that resolution, these beta uh, protein strands are about 4.8 angstroms apart. You see the strands resolved. Uh, if you look at it in the other direction, you can see some side chains and so on. So they built a complete atomic model from this. And in the, let's say, uh, this was 2010, 2011, before, again, the recent um, breakthroughs in detector technology came. And you could still do things like this on film, but it was limited to working on really big viruses where you could find the orientations. And um, so um, after our efforts with... Um, being electron crystallographers, trying to make proteins, finding it was just as difficult to make 2D as 3D crystals, I ended up um, being asked to go to an X-ray microscopy uh, meeting to try and fund beamlines at the European synchrotron. And uh, for this, I did a little mini comparison between electrons, elastic and inelastic cross-sections, X-ray elastic and inelastic, and neutron elastic and inelastic. And it, the, you know, I didn't know exactly what the numbers were, but we always knew electrons were likely to be good. But it turns out when you work out the ratio of the information you get in images or diffraction patterns using these different types of uh, illumination, uh, electrons are well over a 1,000 times more information for the same amount of radiation damage as X-rays. So as part of that, and then neutrons are actually slightly worse as well because they have... Uh, two kinds of little mini nuclear reactions, and they're about three times worse than the electrons. So it became clear that the electrons were good, and we did a calculation back in 1995, which was the, the thing that convinced me at a sort of intellectual level that we should really switch our efforts from being electron crystallographers to single particle people taking pictures of individual molecules, finding them in the image, and then lining them up in the computer. And, and this, this table, which some of you in the audience may have seen before, uh, it w our idea was, let's calculate, now that we know that electrons are going to be better than x-rays, better than neutrons for doing uh, high-resolution imaging, uh, what is the strength of scattering? How much information do you get? How many particles do you need to get a really high-resolution structure? So on the vertical axis, it was from large viruses like adenovirus, 
small viruses like uh, hepatitis B virus cores, ribosomes, like in that early stage, multi-enzymes, down to small proteins like lysozyme or cytochrome C and so on, uh, on the vertical column. And then the various columns you don't need to look at, they are efforts to calculate from basic physics cross-sections for uh, atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and so on, what is the amount of scattering you get? And then with the knowledge of the radiation damage that you get, you get the same type of damage with X-ray diffraction, you can find out whether in an image, and this was an imagined, theoretically perfect image, not one that you could actually get with methodologies that were available. Can you find where it is, and can you find its orientation from the image information? And obviously, the adenovirus, you could look at that, and they did get a structure, but at lowest resolution initially. And it turns out it's about 5 or 10 kilodaltons to see it, and 30 or 40 kilodaltons to find the orientation. And then once you've done that, you put all your images into the computer, find all the orientations, refine them, and then with as we thought in, in 1995, with about 10,000 images of single particles, you get a structure at two or three angstrom resolution. And so then we said, okay, we, we, we should switch our efforts from being electron crystallographers, where you have to make crystals, to taking images and trying to work them out in the computer. And actually, we were so optimistic then, we thought we'd solve the structures. We had a whole list of them within a year. <laughs> and of course, that was complete flop. Many of them we tried to work on, they just didn't, you know, there were, there were various problems. And so um, one, one example um, that shows you what, uh, how, how things developed was this hepatitis B virus score that I showed you in that very first slide. And that was the work of Bettina Botcher in Tony Crowther's group at MRC LMB. And Bettina came uh, from um, a PhD in Germany and initially worked on images like this from a specimen brought by Nikolai Kisilev from uh, Riga in Latvia. And, and uh, Bettina and Tony took images like this, and they got a structure at 30 angstrom resolution. So very similar to the adenovirus structure. And they had, but they only had 20 particles. They were little particles, big particles, T equals B, T equals 4. That was how it was until in Cambridge, we invested in a higher voltage microscope with a field emission gun, a good vacuum, and so on. It was, it was a Hitachi, not a European microscope. And with that, which was very tedious to use, Bettina got images like this. They don't look a lot different, but they have higher resolution data in them. And then she got this first sub-nanometer structure. And then Hong Cho, um, the same one who had the higher resolution structure of adenovirus, again, took the same specimen, worked hard on it with a new higher voltage microscope, more coherent, but still all these images are on film and managed to get with a big particle, easier to find the orientations, a high resolution structure, in which the B factor has been dropped from something like um, 1,000, 500, and now he's down to 200. And then you'll see other structures where this gets better uh, in time. So one of the problems, and, and we had focused on this probably 2002 or so, was that the detectors, i.e. film, were not really very good. So we teamed up with a group, uh, Renato Turcheca, Nicola Garini, who were at Rutherford Appleton, SDFC. Nicola's still there. Uh, Renato now has his own company in Barcelona, and they make these uh, detectors, CMOS detectors, the same one that's in your phone, but you want them to be radiation hardened so that the electron beam doesn't destroy the detector, and all the early ones were destroyed. So this was an early 8-inch uh, wafer with test structures, lots of them. Uh, so that's a detector. It's got 25 different areas. They picked which ones were better, which ones were worse, and then eventually made uh, a detector that would be one of them. And it's now had most of the silicon in that wafer, which is 700 microns thick, removed. And it's been back thinned down to 30 microns thick. So it's, a, it's like a thin piece of paper, actually. You can bend it, and it still works. And, and the high voltage electrons hit the detector, and they go straight through, leaving a very, very sharp, fine um, track for where the particle was. So much cleaner, much better, much higher resolution signal with much lower noise level than you get on film. And when we compared them then, this was the early measurement of detective quantum efficiency against resolution. This would be low resolution. This would be the highest resolution that you get with the pixel size that you selected. Film was about 30%. And then these were the first three companies, GATAN, uh, what is now Thermo Fisher, and Direct Electron. And they're all better than film. But the other advantage they have 
is they all have a very fast frame rate, 30, 40, or several hundred frames per second. So in it, when you press the button to take a picture in the electron microscope, you get a little mini movie. And so if the specimen's moving around, drift, charging, um, beam-induced damage, that can be partly uh, corrected in the computer afterwards. So these two advantages meant there was a sudden change in the power. We'd already got the advantages of high voltage, better vacuums and, and brighter sources, but now this, this extra advantage came. So now what the images look like, they're, they're much nicer than before. So I'm just going to show you half a dozen images that give you a kind of intuitive feel for that table, which is, of course, a, is a dry hand-waving calculation that you might or might not believe in. And, you know. So this is a picture of pyruvate dehydrogenase, a specimen that Richard Perham in Cambridge had been working on and produced one and a half megadaltons, and it's icosahedral, and you can see the two-fold views, the five-fold views, three-fold views, and then this is the hole in the carbon film uh, blotted by the Dubochet plunge freeze method. And you can see the orientations easily, and then as you come down in size, the amount of information in each in image of each particle gets less, so it's harder to find the orientation. But as you come down, this is now a 900 kilodalton structure without any symmetry. This is mitochondrial complex one uh, that uh, John Walker, actually, who I see, uh, started to work on in Cambridge back in the early 1980s, and other people in the MRC mitochondrial biology unit had worked on. And this specimen was brought over by Judy Hurst about three or four years ago, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But again, you can see uh, all the different individual view views, end-on views, side-on views, and there is this sort of L-shaped structure when it's a flat view. So you come down to a smaller structure. This is half a megadalton now. This is uh, beta-galactosidase, the LAC-Z gene from the very first characterized operon in E. coli. It has four identical subunits, uh, and here would be a particle in which the view is, you can see the four subunits. Here's another one, another one, another one, and then there are other views of the particle. So even by eye, you can, you can, and of course in the computer, the orientations can be determined even better. And then you become smaller, this is human uh, erythrocyte catalase. It's also a tetramer. And, and with the Dubochet plunge freeze method, you, you blot the liquid away. And if you blot it a bit too much, it gets very thin in the middle. And then it squeezes the molecules out towards the edge. So the ice is thin here, and it's getting thicker as you go out. And then the catalase molecules, they have a tendency to form these little ribbons where they're interacting with one another when you put it into a thin film. And so all of these molecules in that little circle are all in the same orientation. So you get one view, but for 3D structure, you need all the views. But if you go out a bit further, these are now all in different orientations. And near the edge of the hole, where the, where the carbon film is and the ice has been thicker, they're overlapped a bit. So it would be the molecules here that give you the data that you need to get the 3D structure. And if you come smaller, it's 125 kilodaltons now. This is uh, a protein complex of pentraxin from Mark Pepper's group in London. Uh, it's a, 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 a homopentamer, 525 kilodalton subunit. So you can see this little ring. You can see the five units in the face view and the edge view where there are a little line. And so again, by eye, even at 100 kilodaltons, you can see. So this then fits quite well with those calculations that I showed you earlier. If you come smaller, this would be hemoglobin. And we always thought that Max Perutz would be terribly proud of us if we could determine the structure of hemoglobin without making a crystal. But we thought it was a bit beyond that, too. But fortunately, or, you know, a student at Martinsreed, the Max Planck Institute in, in uh, Martinsreed, working in the group of Radiston Daneff, who had developed some face plates, which gives you extra contrast and so on, uh, and was advised against even trying this by her supervisors, uh, decided to take images like, just like this and within a few days, she had a three angstrom structure of hemoglobin um, where you could see the heme group, the mm -hmm. proximal and distal histidines, and so on. So this is now roughly the limit at which you can get high resolution structures with current technology. It will get better. But if you go smaller, just for demonstration purposes, this is ovalbumin. So you see the little black dots. They're smaller. They do have some orientation, but it's harder to find them. And, and from images like this, you don't get a high resolution structure yet because the, the images are not good enough. And you go smaller, and you still get the black dots. They get just smaller and smaller. And when you're down to about 5 or 10 kilodaltons, uh, the contrast you get from one image, limited by radiation damage, merges into the background. And you can't really tell the difference between where the particle is and from just noise in the ice level. So that's um, 
hopefully given you a kind of a little bit of a theoretical background and some intuitive feeling of how the images look like. What about the structures you get? So I'm just going to show you uh, three or four. One of them, uh, which shows the power of the method really well, uh, was work on mitochondrial ribosomes uh, done by Alexi Amuntz, who was a postdoc in Venki Ramakrishnan's group at the MRC LMB. And now he is a group leader and sort of looks after the, the EM facilities in Stockholm in Sweden. Um, Alexi had been working on mitochondrial ribosomes. There are apparently not very many riboso ribosomes in mitochondria, but he managed to get it largely purified, but collaborated with Xiaoquan Bai in the group of Charles Cherez, also in the LMB. So the two groups with the two postdocs took images like this and processed them with the software rely on that Charles Cherez had started writing in 2010, 2011. And by the time of this paper, it was developed, including methods to having got a rough structure where you've got a mixture of different uh, structures, different states, uh, cytoplasmic and mitochondrial ribosomes all mixed up. He had uh, built into it a method of, in the computer, classifying the images uh, to produce models, 3D classifi 2D classification and 3D classification. And actually, Shores had done this previously uh, as a postdoc in Madrid on a different software suite. But with his new rely on with improved algorithms, they were able to go from images just like this to a spectrum of 3D structures, some of which were mitochondrial ribosomes, others were cytoplasmic ribosomes or uh, un undistinguished states, and sometimes uh, the large and small subunits together, sometimes just the large subunit. And then by focusing on different regions of this, for example, by focusing on the uh, part of the 3D map that's the, the large subunit, you can improve the alignment of the images of the particles, uh, focusing on the large subunits, or you can focus on the small subunits. And then you get a map that's either very good for the large or very good for the small subunits. And, and by doing it for these focused regions, they ended up with an atomic structure for the entire ribosome, uh, three and a half uh, megadaltons. It took them a long time to build the models. But here are some examples of the density, and they really are. And so 3.1 angstrom resolution. These are uh, Watson Crick RNA base pairs. Uh, and sometimes, uh, in the early days, this resolution, people tended to exaggerate it. So now, um, people say, well, does the map look like it has 3.1 angstrom. And these are three and a half angstroms apart, and it drops down to zero. So that tells you that the density uh, by visual observation is uh, reinforcing the formal um, definition of the, of the resolution. And, so, and then if you look at a, a base pair from above, this would be the two of the bases with watson Crick base pairs between them. This would be an alpha helical stretch of the polypeptide with side chains. These would be two little beta loops, beta hairpins, with what they believed to be a magnesium ion in the middle. So that was a really good example, um, a preparation that could not be purified, that was a mixture of different states, flexibility in the subunit. So all the power of single particle EM focused on giving you the result you want, which is, you know, what is the structure of the... So a second one is uh, the spliceosome. And Kiyoshi Nagai's group, also at MRC LMB, had been working on spliceosome and all the different complexes starting in 1990. They began with the X-ray structure of one subunit, then two, and then seven, and then 10. And then as they got more and more bigger complexes, the resolution went down and down because of flexibility and, and disorder in the crystals. And so a student in his lab, Kelly Nguyen, who's currently now a postdoc in uh, Berkeley with Eva Nagales, uh, working on telomerase, she decided that actually the cryo-EM looked like it might be a good thing to use on the spliceosome rather than um, working terribly hard for years trying to make crystals and then make them diffract better. And again, with this focused refinement, they, they were able to get this 3.7 angstrom map initially of the trisnerp, and now they have a lot of different intermediates marking different stages in splicing uh, and giving you a, a, a 3D model of how it works. And again, the density in that here is not as good as in, the, in that ribosome map I showed you, so not quite good enough to resolve the dip in density between the stacked base pairs. But still, here is a stretch of alpha helical part of the PRP3 protein. Here would be a little bit of double helical RNA with the base pairs almost resolved, but there's enough um, features that they were able to identify uniquely the, the 
RNA and the protein sequence with the densities in the map, and then a little bit of, of single-stranded RNA at the bottom. And then uh, the last one I'm going to show you is this <coughs> mitochondrial complex. One, um, so Judy Hurst, who is a group leader in the MRC uh, mitochondrial biology unit in Cambridge, uh, she came probably 20 years ago now um, as a young group leader recruited uh, when John Walker was the director of that unit, and she had been working for a number of years purifying uh, the mitochondrial complex one, trying to make 3D crystals. They had crystals. Uh, they didn't diffract very well, and, and, and many of the subunits of the protein were not in the crystals. So she brought this sample over, and then Vinoth Kumar, who is a postdoc in our group, with Jai Penju, a postdoc with Judy, within a, a month or two, had converted images like this into a map like this. And so this is this L-shaped structure that you saw with these um, molecules. If you contour it at a high level, you see these eight iron sulfur comp uh, complexes. And, and the, the, the way it works is NADH feeds in a redox electron at the top. It flows down this redox chain and reduces a quinone in the membrane. Then somehow that quinone reduction feeds its way into a structural change in the membrane. And there are actually 76 transmembrane uh, alpha helices, so it's at about five or six angstrom resolution. Uh, at a lower contour level, you can see the, the detergent lipid band, because it's been purified in detergent. And, and then Judy and Vinoth and Jaipen went on for about another year and eventually pushed the resolution to about four angstrom and were then able to interpret all of the densities in terms of the 45 different uh, polypeptide chains that make up that structure that doesn't have any symmetry. And in the center of the protein, some of the uh, proteins are colored in blue, and some of the outside ones are in red. The blue ones are the core subunits. And that uh, initial model had been determined um, in, a, in a different group in that same MRC mitochondrial uh, biology unit um, by uh, Leo Sasanov, who's now in, uh, in Vienna and now does both X-ray and cryo-EM. But that's about half of the molecular weights, about 500 kilodaltons of 16 core subunits with 29 of these supernumerary subunits, all of them uh, identified and with models built. And, and now uh, the, the group in Cambridge have this structure, the bovine, and the group with Leo have a, have, have a sheep ovine structure that is very, very similar. So those are uh, three examples of structures that are really impossible to do by any other method than the cryo -EM. Uh, I'll just show you a little bit more about this is that same structure uh, to convince you that you know, there are individual models uh, named. Uh, so this would be a, uh, an outline with one of the domains in one of these sites in the membrane that are coupled to the, uh, the quinone reduction wh where protons are pumped through the membrane. One of them is believed to come in each of these subunits. Um, and, and they have been, there's a model and it's built. But the mechanism of that energy coupling remains to be determined and is a, a subject of, of, of um, investigation at the moment. Okay, so that's hopefully given you um, an example of how we sort of moved along, uh, addressed various problems, and then uh, helped to develop the method that's really now quite powerful. So then if we, want, if we, we look forward a little bit, um, I thought it would be good to tell you what we're thinking about now and where we think perhaps things might develop in the future. So um, one of the ways we think about it comes from work that Peter Rosenthal did when he was a postdoc at LMB. That was before he went to uh, MRC uh, Mill Hill and now to the Crick Institute uh, in London, um, where he helped to uh, uh, run the cryo -M facility as well as doing his own research. So in 2003, we thought we, ought to, we needed to have in addition to hand-waving theories and pretty pictures and improving the methods and just looking at them, we should have a theory that tells us how to think about uh, single particle cryo-EM. And so the idea is that we plot the average structure factor along the vertical and then the resolution on the horizontal. And then the idea is that in these single particle images, you see the little black dot or the big black dot with some internal structure. At lower resolution, all the atoms in the structure are essentially in the same place. Let's say, even if it's a, a ribosome, they're in the same place to within a couple hundred angstroms. So they all scatter coherently, and the structure factor is equal to the number of atoms with a bit of a solvent correction. So that's the solvent correction, the number of atoms. And then at high resolution, 
you can think of the atoms as being random. They're not, of course, they're chemistry, but from the point of view of the scattering theory, they're random. And that is described by Wilson's statistics, which says the average structure factor is the square root of the number of atoms. So here you have the number of atoms, you have the square root of the number of atoms. There's a form factor, the size of the atom, there's a finite size, one or two angstroms, the electron cloud. So that red line is what we expect, roughly and on average, what the structure factors from any single particle embedded in ice should look like. And then we had this theory about radiation damage. There's a certain noise level in each image. And if you only have one particle and you take pictures from different angles, share out the dose, you get a certain noise level. And from our theory, we think that's roughly what the noise level is. That tells you that the signal is always below the noise level if you've only one particle, except at very low resolution. And obviously, if you see it by eye, that means it's above the noise level. So that says that 20 to 20 to 30 angstroms, you can do structures with only one um, copy. So that say in electron cryotomography, you can do low resolution structures. But if you want high resolution structures, you have to average. And this is averaging 10, 10, square root of 10, reduction in noise, 100 and so on. And at some point, when you've got enough particles that you've averaged and you've produced the map with lower noise, the noise is below the signal, and then you just look at it, and there is the structure, and you can interpret it and so on. And when we were doing this um, in 2003, uh, the images weren't very good, and so the images were worse than that. They were blurry, there was charging, there was motion, and in the computer, you're not determining the angles very good, so there was this, these dotted lines indicate uh, practically uh, imperfect versions of what you hope to get one day when you've fixed everything. And in, in, in that time, 2003, when, when that uh, signal reaches the noise level, that tells you, you your resolution. Beyond that, you've still got data there, but it's under the noise level and you can't see it. Lower resolution, you see it. So that was the resolution layer. If you look at real data then, this was Peter's data, 2003. That was that same pyruvate dehydrogenase image that I showed you, the 1.6 uh, megadalton structure. Here's the structure. This is real data now fading down, and then the noise level would be here, and we had some equations that allow you to separate noise and image. And so that's the fading of the Fourier components. And this B factor that I told you describes how they fade. The B factor was 1,000. So similar to the hepatitis B, the adenovirus, and so on. And with a B factor of 1,000 and certain noise levels, he reached a resolution of 8.7. 8, 8 and so that was, at the time, extremely good results. But still, these are just blobs. And, and you know, it wasn't, wasn't good enough. So the idea was to figure out what to do to make it better. And Peter introduced this plot, which we now call it a, a Rosenthal plot. And the idea was um, you plot the number of particles that you're averaging to make your 3D map against the resolution that you get. And Peter's data, he had 3,500 particles, and he had 8.7 angstrom resolution. That's his data. And then this was our theory. So we said, OK, you know, we think we know what we're doing but we've got a B factor of 1,000, and if we want higher resolution, we could, we could just take more data and go down here. But even if we took, you know, 100 million particles, which would be, I know, like, you know, hundreds of PhD students and so on and so on, you would only reach six angstrom. So obviously, this is not the way to go. You, what you need is to make the images better to get B factors of 500, 250, and so on. That's exactly uh, what's happened. So if we now jump to a year or two ago, here are three structures with this type of this Rosenthal plot, except that um, now people have they've flipped the axes. This is still resolution, but instead of the number of particles uh, you know, coming downwards, it now goes upwards. And so this was a, a data set from uh, Radostin Danef, the same person who developed the phase plate that Miriam Koshai did that hemoglobin structure I mentioned before. And they plot uh, number of particles against resolution. And with a lot of particles, 100,000, and with the proteasome, which is, this is a proteasome data set, 14-fold symmetry, they got about 2.2 angstrom resolution. They put less particles from the same data set into the map. The resolution goes down and down and down until you're eventually at 5 or 10 angstrom resolution. But the fact that that's a really nice straight line uh, with a slope with a B factor of 100 tells you that all the data, on average, behaves as though there's a single blurring factor in it. Obviously, uh, some of them will be better and some are worse, but on average, that's what it is. And then these are two more data sets that Vinoth Kumar, collaborating with uh, two groups in India, and he still works on these, uh, uh, got similar uh, data. This was with a phase plate, without a phase plate, but similar B factors, about 100. 
So the idea is that these ty this type of plot tells you how well you're doing and, and tries to focus you on what to do next to try and make it better. But in these three examples, uh, at lowish resolution, say six or 10 angstroms, you only need about 1,000. And it's the B factor being too high that means you need more particles than we want one day to have to reach high resolution. Okay, so another plot that we like, I'm only gonna show you two. This is one, this is the next plot. Uh, information content in the movie frames. Because you press the button and you get a movie now and then you do try to do the alignment, if you could perfectly align for any blurring or image motion, then it would be, uh, every frame would be perfect. And actually the first frame would be the best one. But actually the first frame is almost the worst. And then it gets a bit better, a bit better. And then between about five and 10 electrons per square angstroms, the middle part of the movie, you get good data with a low B factor. And then, and then the, 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 the map you get is, of course, a combination of all of them. But all of these two ribosome data sets, mitochondrial complex, one beta galaxide, they all show the same, uh, the same features. So one of the new young group leaders at the LMB, Chris Russo and I, have been trying to put two and two together to try to explain where this comes from so that we know what to do. And this is our kind of rough theory. Uh, it's called, you know, grand scheme. We're going to try to explain everything. It doesn't cure anything, but it explains it. It's like going to the doctor and having a diagnosis, but unfortunately he says, I'm afraid there's no cure. You just have to. Um, so the idea is that if it's perfect, the first image that you take will have a B factor of zero. And then as you introduce radiation damage, and go to an exposure of 25 electrons, you gradually, and we think it's around five, six, seven uh, B factor per electron per square angstrom. So it goes up and up. And by the end here, you've got a B factor of about 150. And then what we're getting in these structures, initially we had terrible other reasons, but at the moment we're in about here. And the reason, because the top of this curve is, is in that region. And then these are factors in the imaging procedure, in the physics of the interaction between the beam and the specimen that degrade the image. So one of them is that the water, the thin film of Dubochet plunge frozen ice, the water itself gets damaged and the water molecules at H dot, OH dot, OH minus, you know, H plus and so on, they move around and they re-associate, but they've moved. So there's what we call water pseudo-Brownian motion induced by the beam. And, and we don't mind about the water molecules, that's a nice even background, but it pushes the molecules around. But fortunately, we've measured it now and it's not a killer factor, but it reduces this B factor slightly because of Brownian motion. And then there is, uh, electrons are charged, the specimen, a thin film of water is uncharged, it's an insulator, it charges up, there are charge fluctuations. Again, uh, Chris and I, we've measured this. It's, it's important, you need to know about it, but it isn't a killer. The thing that at the moment is the rate limiting one is this beam induced specimen motion. It's when the beam comes on the specimen, the water molecules can move around and then stresses that have been frozen into the specimen when you plunge freeze it into the liquid ethane, those stresses are released and that's what we think is happening here. So something needs to be done either to create a thin film that doesn't have stresses or to find a way of releasing it without doing radiation damage. So that's where we're at at the moment. And then I thought I'd show you one really good structure, uh, which apparently nowadays uh, all uh, innovations are published on Twitter, uh, which I don't look at. But one day, about six months ago, someone said, oh, have you seen Twitter this morning? And this was it. It was Dimitri Lyunkis's work on another virus, adeno-associated virus. And what Dimitri and his group at Salk Institute in California did was to read all the papers and do everything everybody said would help your imaging. So they used them. Um, uh, gold grids, thick gold with hole, small holes in them. Uh, they used uh, parallel beams, they used all the, and, it, and he got a 1.86 angstrom structure. And these are side chains out of this virus. So phenylalanines, tyrosines, tryptophans, all of them really beautiful. And so this is a really good uh, structure. And the, one of the reasons I like it is that uh, he, he decided uh, uh, to include in the paper the two plots that we like. So this is the uh, Peter Rosenthal plot, and then this is the information versus dose plot. And his B factor was 60. And he was using a piece of software, FreeAlign, that was written by Mikhail Grigoriev. And in that, for 10 years, they've had a correction factor for evolt sphere curvature. Now, X-ray crystallographers know about this at all. It's really a big, important thing. But, but in electron microscopy, the wavelength is so short, this evolt sphere is very flat. 
and this, is, this was the first data set where by switching that correction on, they actually got an improvement from 60 to 50. And then similarly in this um, information versus uh, electron dose, by taking all these precautions and having better and so on, it moved the, the peak. Instead of it being between 5 and 10, it's moved to the left. And that's the region where you have less radiation damage, higher quality data. But we think eventually, once it's fixed, this line will go all the way here and it will go all the way up. And so you know, that will give you another quite considerable factor uh, that will do it. So one last one is uh, uh, the computer program written by Charles Cherez has been improved. It was rely on one in 2012, rely on two a couple of years later, and, and recently it's rely on three. And they've now reprocessed a lot of the data which gave B factors of 100 or 120 before. And with further purely com computational improvements, they've been able to get uh, two data sets, one on beta galactosidase, one on apoferritin taken by Sriram's group and Wim Hagen's group. And they've now got these uh, Rosenthal plots, B factors of 56 and 66. And actually, I saw one recently where they've got it down to about 45. So the bottom line then is that uh, the one thing we can't ever fix is the radiation damage, but the effects of it, you can kind of get around them and program around it with computer programs, with better images, with better detectors and so on. And, and then 10 or 15 years ago, we were in the blobology um, era of electron crime microscopy where people said, oh, we, we don't want that, we want atoms. And, and the B factors were 500 or 1,000 and that was the limitation. But then the microscopes, the hardware and so on were improved and then a couple of years ago, we were B factors of about 100, and people were very happy. But now, uh, it's down to 50, 60. Uh, and we hope that with uh, the remaining problems, you'll get it down to about 30. And then you'll be, you still have to take an image. And only the very first frame, very low dose, will be zero. So that would be maybe uh, 10 electrons per square angstrom. And you get a really good structure. So you can then use that either to get the same structure with fewer, less, fewer images, fewer particles, or a higher resolution or more multiple states and so on. So at the moment now, people are very optimistic about this. So we think so it's going to get better and this is a really good time to do it. And then behind this, there's a group in Japan, Yoshi Fujiyoshi, who between about 1990 and 2000 was very keen on liquid helium cooling of the specimen. Mm. The radiation damage is a bit less. And actually the microscope that was bought here, the, fe the very first one of this Polara series was uh, liquid helium capable. And, and actually, we um, try to finish by saying, so when, when, when Imperial threw it out, we bought it. Uh, <laughs> but we, we only paid 9,000 pounds instead of you know, several million. And we only use it for spare parts because we have two of these helium microscopes. And we are trying to uh, overcome. The, the, the reason it's not become popular is this beam-induced motion is worse at liquid helium. But once you've fixed it, at higher temperature, you probably you can go on and fix it. So there are quite a lot of basic improvements that are going to make the method even better. So then uh, looking forward, we need a number of things. Uh, the high voltage microscopes with field emission guns are good back then. They are expensive. They're several million pounds each. And that means national centers like EBIC at Diamond are a good way to do it. Or uh, focus centers with a number of instruments like in CRIC or in LMB. But we still need bigger and faster detectors, because um, then you'll get more data from the same investment of, of, um, of, of money. Uh, the phase plates that Radostan Danef and Miriam Koshai developed, um, are, they work, but they're very sort of iffy and difficult to work with. If you could get a good one, there's nothing against it in physics that works every time, and you don't even have to think about that, make a big difference. And then uh, these will all help. Uh, to do computer-controlled removal of beam-induced motion, but also there might be physical ways of doing it with better grids. And then we're going to keep helium in mind at the background. But then one of the, and I'll show you one slide about this, one of the things that now that we've got over most of the really sort of, let's say, big problems that were really limiting progress, there are now lots of smaller problems where you can get smaller improvements. And so one of them, we thought, Everybody needs to have a cheap microscope so they can get their specimens developed and then go to these national centers. So we've been for about two or three years now trying to persuade the companies to make a cheap microscope, 100 kV, with a good source and a good detector. And it doesn't exist at the moment. They, the, the manufacturers like 
to sell you the expensive model. So you know, that's one of the ideas. And so one of the things behind this, and again, Chris Russo and I looked into this, we're, we're comparing now, and I'll explain this just in a minute, this is electron energy along the horizontal line. This is 100 kV, this is 300 kV. That's the, the range of microscopes transmission EM that you can buy. In principle, you can go higher. There are several microscopes in Japan at 1 MeV, 3 MeV, <laughs> and you can also go lower. And then so what we asked is, where do you get the most information if you're limited by radiation damage? And that's the inelastic and the elastic cross sections. And actually these two lines, the same as on that very earlier graph, as you go to lower energy, they get closer together. So actually you get more elastic scattering, which is what gives you the high resolution image, for the same amount of radiation damage, which is proportional to this sigma i. However, as you go to uh, lower energy, depending on your specimen thickness, you lose electrons, they get scattered, and you lose them. And so these graphs here are plots of, so this one here is the plot of the ratio of elastic to inelastic multiplied by the transmission for a 1,000 angstrom, a 300 angstrom, or a 100 angstrom thick specimens. And almost all the specimens that we, we're interested in, we use, all the ones I showed you images of, they're all uh, two, three, 400 angstrom resolution. So the, the ones where it's catalase was squeezed out, that thickness of the catalase, it's about 100 angstroms. So we think 300 angstroms will be the vast bulk of single particle EM data. And if you plot this graph for 300, the peak where you get the most information is exactly at 100 kV, mm -hmm. not at 300. Whereas for tomography, where you want a thick specimen, you still want a thicker one. And then there are various other things. And that's now just uh, in press in ultramicroscopy. And then one last thing, this is liquid helium, uh, purple membrane. This is on this... Uh, uh, the microscope, similar to the one at uh, Imperial, uh, liquid helium, liquid nitrogen, you get about a 1.6-fold improvement, but that's not proper liquid helium yet, so we're still working on that. And then the last slide is, this is our wish list. Uh, a problem I haven't mentioned, uh, there are lots of terribly important structures that cannot be crystallized, and when you make this thin film and ice, they fall apart. And it's uh, denaturation at the air-water interface. So you need more physical chemistry, maybe, I don't know, some ways of doing that uh, that are not yet thought of, Impro which might involve improved specimen supports. It might involve better detectors with less fixed pattern noise so that you can do better motion correction. These are all to do with addressing that early stage of the, of the image. And then we really need uh, a, a good, top quality, inexpensive microscope and we don't have a detector that works well at 100 kV. We only have detectors that work well at high voltage and with liquid helium. And then with that, I was going to finish with um, just saying a brief overview and thank you. So my background and sort of career trajectory, if you like, started off in physics, uh, X-ray diffraction, but uh, only by chance, hearing a talk by Nigel Unwin in 1973, did I make a little transition and then did some work with Nigel and then we didn't know quite how to get from seven to three angstroms. In the end, it was cryo-EM, and that was Bob Glazer and Ken Downing. They had a microscope in Berkeley. Fritz and Eric had a microscope in Berlin. And Jean Le Paul was a postdoc in Dubochet's group developing liquid helium microscope under John Kendrew's um, supervision. And then David Agar, Tom, and Joyce, were we, that, they were the people working to go from seven to three angstroms. And then one of the things in going uh, eventually to single particles was better detectors and that's uh, Wazi, Faruqi, and Greg in the LMB, Renato and Nicola in Rao, and then Shausha, who was the EM facility manager here at Imperial uh, from about 1999 to 2003, and we recruited her to Cambridge. So uh, she's now running things in Cambridge. Um, and then these were the people who uh, first were doing all the single particle work. So Sriram and Jacqueline, uh, Pirate Dehygenase, Nico Roach, Free Align, and is now in Howard Hughes in the US, John Rubenstein, who worked on F1, FO, ATPs in John Walker's lab, did a PhD with him, mitochondrial biology. He's now in Toronto leading, uh, really, the leading work on this F1, FO, and V1, V0 work in terms of cryo-EM. And then Peter's at the Crick, Vinos at Bangalore in India, running the Indian cryo -EM national facility, and then Chris is a, a new group leader in the LMB working on specimen preparation and all the fundamentals. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea of, you know, let's say, the, the, the trajectory to get to where we are, but a lot of things still need to be fixed, 
and done. And, and so this is a great time to be at Carnegie Yen. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm honored to have been asked to propose this vote of thanks to Richard Henderson on behalf of Imperial College. My name is Dorian Bubeck, and I'm a senior lecturer here in the Department of Life Sciences, working in the field of cryo-EM. You've heard all about Richard's technical contributions to the field, but it's his eternal optimism that this technique could really deliver on its promise of high-resolution imaging for biological molecules has really inspired the next generation of electron microscopists. Today, we are witnessing a turning point in structural biology. It's thanks to Richard and his contributions that cryo-EM is not burdened by the limitations that it once had. He mentioned how it was affectionately called once uh, blobology, but I have to say, I'm happy to say now that with the advancements from Richard and others in the field, the precision which we can now determine the orientation of these images means that we can obtain real chemical information for protein-protein interactions, and that's essentially underpinning new lines of investigation using cryo-EM for drug discovery. EM is no longer limited to the viruses and large macromolecular complexes that Richard showed in the very beginning parts of his slide, like adenovirus, um, but now can be used to routinely solve the structures of the smaller molecular weight proteins like pentraxin and even hemoglobin at 64 kilodaltons. Cryo-EM is also no longer limited to static snapshots of proteins. It can, it can give you real dynamic information for proteins, um, and he showed that so eloquently with his example of the spliceosome, of how you can really understand molecular motions of proteins and how those provide insight into those functions. Richard's contributions have completely changed the field of cryoelectron microscopy, widening the scope of a technique and the impact it can have. Even in my lifetime, I've witnessed the complete change of this technique from a niche method practiced by only a few labs to becoming exploding into <laughs> nature's method of the year just a few years back. Um, and Richard continues to innovate new ways of making cryo-EM better, as so eloquently articulated in his grand scheme, um, and articulating the new challenges of cryo-EM. And I'm particularly keen to try to see how the development of better, de better electron detectors at 100 kV really widens the field further and lowers that barrier for entry in an otherwise rather expensive technique. <clears throat> Richard has always worked hard to create a field that's both inclusive and collaborative. Um, since moving to the UK, I am personally grateful for the, all the advice Richard has given me, whether it's been uh, taking the time to think through a tricky image processing problem during my postdoc, or mentor me through the challenging transition of leading my own research team or opening up opportunities for me as a young group leader coming back from maternity leave and giving my, my first shot at cryo's time at the LMB. Richard continues to inspire the next generation of cryo-EM. So to conclude, I would like to again call for a vote of thanks for Richard Henderson for his fascinating lecture on cryo-EM. Well, I don't have a mic. So, and now we can take questions. I don't know, you should come up to the front. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is Michael Sternberg's slide. So I, don't, I, yeah. think it, I think it afterwards it says vote of thanks. So oh, we've sorry. done the vote of thanks first. Sorry. No, it's the first anyway. time no, no. I'm doing this. No, 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 <laughs> I didn't no, 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 get properly briefed. He didn't briefed. show you. He, did, he didn't show me. <laughs> I didn't make the slides. Yeah, yeah. So yes, we can take questions yeah. then. Yeah, please. Alice. I have a very motion you're seeing is due to the rearrangement of the vitreous water when it has wind damage. So you need to try and minimize the change, and water is a source of extremely strange molecules. It is, yeah. Um, so I have two questions. One is, do you still use liquid ethane, which was designed to be used to transfragrance yeah. to cause it to vitrify? Are there other ways of vitrifying at different rates or temperatures with different solvents Solvents 
other than water in that way. I mean, it would be really nice if there was another way of making this thin film. Um, but you know, this uh, work from Jacques Dubochet's group in the, in the early 1980s, uh, they were trying lots of different things, actually. And it was um, Alistair McDowell, who had been recruited to MBL from the vet school in Edinburgh. He went there. And they were just trying things. He, he, he said, I'll try ethane. And it is exactly because of this. There's a big yeah, minus 180. Yeah, yeah. Right. you've got about 100 degrees before it boils. And, and none of the others are quite as good as that. Although some people like to mix it with a you know, ethane uh, propane mixture because then it doesn't freeze. At, so you have to have it slightly above liquid nitrogen temperature. OK, but there isn't yet a solution to that. But one, one idea that we've had is that that initial, so the water molecule, even if you took pure water or D2 or whatever, and you make a thin film, there are ways of taking images and processing them that describe, allow you to understand how they move. And they move, and, and there doesn't seem to be any way around this, because um, you know, you, you're, you're breaking bonds and then they reform. So, yeah, the bulk water away from the surfaces that you're ionizing and, and, and breaking bonds and so on. It, it diffuses around and then reforms. But the ones on the surface, they evaporate as hydrogen, oxygen, gas, and then it gradually gets thinner and thinner and thinner and so on. So that, we don't think you could get around that, but the, the one that, that the very beginning of the exposure, where somehow or other it moves a lot, and, and the images don't have enough information, the detectors aren't perfectly and so on, uh, that, we think, is stresses that are built up when you freeze it. And, and when you freeze it, water goes from a density of one to about 0.92. So ice is lighter and the amorphous ice is lighter as well. Whereas the carbon films and the gold, you know, they all shrink a little bit. So you've got a differential expansion. And so one idea that you know, has been already investigated by the crystallographers, because they freeze crystals too, and they also have proteins with water. The water expands, the protein shrinks. They, they came up with the idea that you should use antifreezes. For example, like 30% ethylene glycol turns out when you freeze that, it shrinks about the same as the protein. So one idea was instead of using water, you might try a few other water-like things that don't expand but shrink. And nobody has really investigated that yet. We had a few little things, but it needs somebody to say. And, and the trouble is, I think, uh, if you have a research group and you're doing structural biology, the students, they would like to determine a structure of something interesting. They really don't want to work on water and ethylene glycol. <laughs> But you know, maybe there's uh, you know an enthusiastic person that would like to come in front. Anyway, that's one of the ideas. But something like that, and then there are other things like um, I think was it um, there are other other solvents like butane, for example, that you know it's, it's I forget it it freezes at or liquefies at zero and it freezes at so there it has a big range too. But, but proteins don't normally go into butane, but maybe you could put them in little um, aqueous uh, uh, spheres inside a different sample. So there, there are actually there's an enormous amount of stuff that nobody has even thought of trying it so far. But, so it's a good idea. Yeah. I think a microemulsion where the size of each droplet was slightly bigger than your protein yeah. might well be something, you know, because that might not move around because it's in a different solvent that's not, it's, but nobody has invested anything like that. They're all, everyone, so the Dubochet plunge is 1982, and now here we are nearly 40 years later, and that is exactly what people do. They say, I think I'll try some different filter paper, or, you know, I'll buy an instrument from Leica instead of, but they don't, you know, think further out of the box. Can we take some more questions? <laughs> I, I, what? Can you use the microphone? Oh, yeah. Okay. Two micron meter diameter bits, and then you move back around the office. Uh, there's a question in the back. I can't quite see this person here. Can someone hand them a mic? Oh, you've got one. Oh, you have the mic. You have the mic. So you need to find someone oh, to give it someone to. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else put their hand up. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what about time-resolving uh, imaging so that we can get ideas of how enzymes are actually working? Yeah. Of course, you've got to get the resolution, but where there's macroscopic changes, 
well, rightly so, I suppose, as well, yeah. No, I think, I, I think there are actually, although there aren't so many people working on the sort of basic thing, there are a lot of people very interested in time-resolved work. Um, you know, ribosome assembly, ribosome translation, where you can, and then you initiate it with a light flash or by spray freezing. And, and, and in the time of, let's say, five to 10 milliseconds or slower, you can do this at the moment. And actually there are papers published where uh, data is collected and then they sort it into all these different classes and then try to put it into a time order and then correlate it with the kinetics. And so that's entirely doable actually, but obviously you have to freeze it and then analyze it at your leisure later on in the microscope. So you'd be, it's, it's a freeze trapping, which is a classical time resolved way of, do, of doing kinetics. And you can do that with the EM, with the images, yeah. Other questions? Super hard to see with the light in your eyes. Does anyone else have a question? I don't see any. No other questions? Okay, so with that, I just want to thank Richard again. Well, by, stand, by standing to the side. You could